Max Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Hi there, and welcome to our Highlights edition. And to get into the groove, here's a quick look at our top picks from the past week. On the Rocks, artist Olafur Eliasson and his Riverbed exhibit. Istanbul Calling, photographer Erdal Inji and his animated GIF files. And lush Lausanne garden architects turn a Swiss city into a green oasis. Olafur Eliasson is one of Europe's most successful contemporary artists. He was born in Denmark and raised in Iceland. And while he's now based in Berlin, his artistic vision is strongly influenced by the natural phenomena that he experienced growing up in that northern island nation. Well, his installations tend to play with our perceptions of what nature is really all about. And now his latest work is flowing through the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. That's just north of Copenhagen. A riverbed full of rocks. But this landscape isn't outdoors. It's part of an installation by Olafur Eliasson in Denmark's Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. Eliasson often explores natural phenomena in his work. This river is indoors, enclosed by walls. But the cool water and fresh air make it seem surprisingly real. When people come in, they find themselves disconcerted at first. But even though it might seem disconcerting, there's still a reassuring aspect to it. You can find your way and orient yourself, even when you're outside of your usual mode of perception. That's important, because when we look at the world, we often tend to assume that everything outside our own horizon doesn't actually exist and everything within it is unchangeable and fixed. But nothing is actually fixed. Everything is always in flux. As they explore the riverbed, the visitors become submerged in the work. It's art that speaks to all the senses. It's really hard to grasp what's really happening. So it's just confusing. It's like to be somehow outside, but in an artificial way. It's com contemplative, like you can listen to the, the sound of people walking around. That's really nice. The installation extends over four rooms and covers about a thousand square meters in all. Eliasson had the rocks brought here directly from Iceland. A hidden pump transports the water along the riverbed. An air conditioning unit cools and dehumidifies the air. It's all very carefully planned and executed, all the way down to the simulated daylight that shines from above. I wouldn't say it was easy to create, but basically it is just rocks, a bit of water, some pumps and wood. It's not hard to make something like this. Anyone could do it, and really everyone should do it. The quantifiable aspects, like how many tons of rock, how much money, how much does it cost, that's not at all that interesting. The things that are hard to quantify, that's what's important here. The effect, too, is unquantifiable, but powerful nonetheless. Creating the installation even required some modifications to the building itself, like new passageways broken through walls. The finished work reflects the architecture of the museum itself, where the boundaries between interior and exterior blur. The architecture, garden and landscape join in a single harmonious entity. The museum's director, Paul Eric Toyner, gave Eliasson permission to reconfigure the interior space. I see this a little bit like a stress test uh, of the museum. How far can you actually go? And I think Olafur, it's a way that Olafur facilitates his own mind thinking you know, beyond the limits. And my, uh, my role has been to not only to draw him back, but to listen to him and find out what can we actually do. So it has been uh, qu quite a, a fruitful dialogue. Exploring limits is Eliasson's trademark. In 2003, his installation at London State Modern featured an enormous artificial sun. He employs a staff of 70 in his Berlin studio. Though he's now based in the German capital, the artist pays regular visits to Iceland, where he grew up. His many photographs of Icelandic landscapes served as inspiration for the riverbed installation. I 
Landscapes like this are very familiar to me. They might not look spectacular at first glance, but actually they're fantastic somehow. They occupy that strange space between the familiar and the intimate and evoke the power of the river. But at the same time, it's strange, like the end of the world, like something that's dead. A riverbed as cold and barren as a moonscape. Strange yet familiar, it calls for quiet contemplation, something the artist too can enjoy. Well, no quiet contemplation in this next piece, just some surefire thrills. Think of a landmark concert by one of your favorite bands, a dynamite light show, and some rushing waterfalls, and the Aquanario show puts them all together to surprising effect. Now, the show enhances the usual audiovisuals of a musical concert with about enough water to fill a 25-meter swimming pool, and it's certainly pulling in the crowd. So we caught up with this multimedial form of watertainment in Berlin. A multimedia extravaganza featuring water, lasers, and pyrotechnics synchronized with music. Welcome to Aquanario, Europe's biggest mobile water show. It's pretty incredible what you can do with water. I've never seen anything like this before. The way that the colors and the water interact is really amazing. Beautiful. It was amazing. The lighting, the fireworks, and excellent musicians. It's an unusual experience for the musicians from the Pink Floyd Show UK. They're no strangers to mega events, but what's different here is that they're sharing the spotlight. I love it, I think it's brilliant. Um, the, the actual show itself, the Aquanario, the, the water and the lasers, it's, just, it's a complete spectacle, it looks insane. And just the way it matches up with the music, it's, it's perfect for Pink Floyd's music. Aquanario premiered in 2012. It's since featured a wide range of era-spanning international music acts. such as the cover band Pink Floyd Show UK. Their repertoire comprises hits from the band's 30-year history. The music and the special effects are in perfect sync. For show designer Misha Anton, precision is everything. It's very stressful because there's so much to take into account, especially the band. I have to keep an eye on the technological side of it, but I also need to follow what's going on on stage. I'm in charge of the water, the pyrotechnics and the lighting. It took Aquanario's 100 strong team an entire week to set up. They laid 15,000 meters of cable and transported 300 tons of equipment. The whole system is about the size of a small swimming pool. It contains half a million liters of water. I'd say that sustainability is an issue for everyone these days. Wasting water would be disastrous. We pump the water into the pool and we work with it. We don't add any chemicals. And when the show's over, we make sure it goes back into the groundwater. The show is a technological challenge, and the conditions are especially daunting. The problem is actually more the cold. We have lots of nozzles that have to be set by hand so they're perfectly aligned. And then you have to wade into the pool because the nozzles only work if they're full of water. So you have to deal with the cold and try to overcome it. The effort that goes into the show is matched by the numbers of the audience. Over 120,000 people have already seen it. Yeah, 
During the show, 85,000 liters of water shoot into the air from 170 spouts in seven fountains. The Pink Floyd Show UK band will only be part of the show's Berlin performances, but once flowing, the water can't be stopped. In coming days, it will be gushing to the sounds of various epochs and the sights of a unique underwater journey. Well, anyone who's computer savvy will know that it's a mainstay of most websites, the GIF file. And I must add that many people are now calling them GIFs, G-I-F, which stands for Graphics Interchange Format. Now, these are low-resolution files that support transparency and animation, and so they're great for creating moving images with things like logos or icons. Well, with limited colors, they're also quick to load and easy to share, and artists like Erdal Inji are exploiting them in new ways. Alluring light sculptures in an endless loop. These are all animated GIF files. They were created in the Turkish city of Istanbul by multimedia artist Erdal Inşi. In his view, the 90s computer format is now on the cutting edge of visual arts. For Inchi, the file type is endlessly inspiring. My fascination about GIFs is uh, repetition because they, it doesn't have a beginning or end. It's repeating like a circle. So that GIF format is perfect for my videos. Istanbul is where Adal Inchi has lived and worked for half a decade. He began posting GIFs on his blog two years ago. Unlike more modern image formats, GIFs are supported by all kinds of browsers, and because they aren't huge in size, they're easy to share. Erdal Inchi's art GIFs quickly took off online. His works have been liked more than 150,000 times. The best thing to have a blog is, for me, uh, you can get instant feedback, and you can get instant comments, so you don't have to wait to exhibit your work in a gallery. Inchi is a spontaneous artist who rarely plans his creations. Today he's using a massive stencil to make a new GIF. It's vital that there are not many people around while he's filming. So he often records at night or in the early morning. To make sure his on-camera movements are as consistent as possible, Inchi uses a metronome to keep time. Inchi often causes a stir when he films. Passers-by check out what he's doing, and they end up in his videos. It takes him just half an hour to film what he needs. Afterwards, he checks the outcome of his work. When I do the performance, I don't know if it's work or not. So uh, I need to experiment. And I think uh, it's the right way to find something new. Yeah. Since the start of the decade, GIFs have been back in fashion. US photographers Kevin Berg and Jamie Beck pioneered the trend called cinemagraphs. This work alone has been clicked around 200 million times. And British artist Inza is famous for both his graffiti and for his GIFs. Since their comeback, GIFs have escaped the World Wide Web. They've become part of the urban landscape. And they've gone viral in the art world too. Cultural critic Ebru Yatishkin is a big fan of GIFs in the gallery. Well, GIFs are um, one of the most contemporary art forms that uh, we are producing today. Um, they are short and uh, since we are following a lot of um, web pages, we are surfing on the internet so much, we get used to how to read the images and sounds in a very quick way. 
Belal Inshi is taking advantage of the last rays of sun to make another animated GIF. Filming doesn't take long. But the artist will be in post-production for up to a week. There, he edits down the images until the final animated GIF emerges. Inchi specializes in patterns that have got more and more elaborate with time. He's always coming up with fresh ideas for GIFs. I would, for example, I would put a carpet, a large, uh, massive carpet uh, made of humans on a square. The Turkish artist's incredible creations are in great demand. So Ed Alinci wanders through the empty streets of Istanbul, making yet another animated GIF, his latest light sculpture. And in the streets of Lausanne in western Switzerland, the city's garden festival brings flowers and a lot of restorative foliage into the heart of the urban landscape. Every three to five years, Lausanne Jardin is the name of it, greens up its city centre. And this year's fifth edition seeks to use those gardens as something of an architectural enhancement. So our reporter checked it out. Lausanne has some surprises in store this summer. Facades adorned with plants and flowers. A building that seems to sprout from a tree trunk. Even the cathedral is blooming. Lausanne Jardin, the city's festival of gardens, is taking place for the fifth time this year. Local residents are delighted. It brings some color to all the gray. It's like having a bit of countryside. It makes you want to see the whole city. This year's show was put together by French architect Christophe Ponceau and Swiss curator Adrien Robero. What's special about Lausanne Jardin is that the gardens are in the city, not just in the parks or on the outskirts, but right in the center. The first Lausanne Jardin took place in 1997. It's been drawing landscape architects, gardeners, and designers from all over Switzerland ever since. They want to make the city even greener, and their creativity knows no bounds. This year, we've come up with something a bit different. We're talking about the ephemeral, about chance and of landing. That's why we called it landing. We decided to take a map, and each of us took 15 seeds, Christoph and I, and we just dropped them on the map like this. One of these landings is on the roof of a high rise in the city center. Now it's been transformed into an urban greenhouse. Called City Crown, it was designed by a team headed by British born landscape architect Augusto Colonda. The idea was um, not only to produce uh, something, produc uh, to, to have productive planting um, on a disused or uh, forgotten urban space, but also to contribute something to the skyline of the city. One such innovative idea is the project Plant Line. Instead of underwear and t-shirts, a kind of laundry line holds herbs for budding urban cooks. Local graphic designer Julien Mercier and designer Manon Briot came up with the idea. We had contact with people who live or work in these buildings while we were setting it up. One woman kept saying she wanted basil on her line for her salads. Adrien Rovero is pleased with the overall reception. The idea of the garden show has now taken off in other cities too. I think it's important to continue to reflect and think about solutions concerning plants in a city, to surprise people and provide answers regarding the evolution of the city. The festival continues until early October. By then, some of the plants may have wilted, but it will take longer than that for the pleasure they bring to Lausanne's residents to fade. And the countdown to the next Lausanne Jardin has already started.
And finally, we'll finish off with a visit to the Latvian resort of Jurmala. Now, this is one of the more famous seaside destinations in the Baltic states, otherwise known as the Riviera of the North. The beach is located just west of the capital Riga, and Jurmala is the fifth largest city in Latvia these days. Well, spa tourism is big here because of the mineral springs at nearby Kemeri, whose healing properties have been praised for almost 200 years. So our tour takes us to Jurmala and also to Kemeri National Park. The Duke of Courland once sailed the Baltic Sea on a ship like this one. This is a reconstruction of the 17th century schooner and it remains faithful to the original design. It's a dream come true for Captain Anatoly Malokhanov. He previously used it for fishing trips, but now takes tourists out to sea. Well, that was Sweden, and this was Courland. The Duke of Courland was a shrewd businessman who set up companies and factories. He owned three shipyards for the construction of both trade and military vessels. He also had three masted ships with a hundred cannon. Even the English were scared of his ships. It's an adventure for holidaymakers, even if their sailing trip only lasts a few hours. The shot can be heard in the resort town of Jurmala. Latvia's answer to the French Riviera, it first attracted tourists over 200 years ago. The sandy beach stretches for over 30 kilometers. Jurmala soon became a meeting point for artists, intellectuals and famous people. When people ask me who's been here, I always say it's easier to list those who haven't. The town owes much of its charm to its wooden architecture. Over 400 of the houses are listed. While many have been renovated, some are still in need of attention. They vary greatly in terms of size and style. Not far from Yurmala is Kemeri, famous for its sulfur springs and healing mud baths. There used to be sanatoriums here, but the infrastructure collapsed with the Soviet Union. The hot springs form in the high moorland of Kemeri National Park, where visitors can take a three-kilometer walk to get closer to nature. Agnese Balandina has been a ranger here for four years. The fauna and flora of a raised bog is not very diverse, but you don't find anywhere else. You can also see some pines, but it never grows as big as a normal pine in the forest because it grows on this acid water. So these pines, some of them are more than 100 or even 200 years old. This moss is so special because it acts like a sponge. It soaks up uh, up to 25 times more water than it weighs. And actually, it is the first baby diaper. Back in the town center. Come evening, after long days on the beach or in the thick of nature, Yurmala fills with people looking for good food and entertainment. And they don't have to look very far because the Latvian Riviera has it all. Well, that does bring us to the end of this edition of our Euromax highlights. So hope you enjoyed it. Until we meet again, all the best from us here in the studio in Berlin. And thanks for watching. Auf Wiedersehen and bye-bye.